Higher education offers a real home to young women and men during crisis situations. It increases resilience and gives hope for the future. Yet, in emergencies, higher education is too often misunderstood and neglected. We lost our chances in Syria. I tried to complete my study there, but uh, the situation, it gets worse. Things got very desperate and I said, I'm going to give up. Whatever is going to happen, just let it happen. I, you know when you get desperate. I don't know, it was like a gift. A long four years and a half, I was really, I fight it a lot. You can't imagine, but with my family, with the universities, with life. So it's my dream, I will not quit. I will, I will never give up. I'm a dentist. I'm here to complete my postgraduate study. I'm an architect and I'm studying master degree in urban planning. Serious for me, it's like, um, it's like the passion. We have uh, areas are free. Everything damaged, everything destroyed. That's a bad thing, but you can you can have some light in that. That we can build something new, something more modern. I'm a mechanical engineer, and I am studying robotics at Coimbra University in Portugal. All of my friends who are graduated like me from university, they do not believe in violence. Educated people do not believe in violence. I do not think anybody is going to carry a weapon and sacrifice his life unless he, he didn't find any other opportunity to contribute to humanity. I am an electrical engineer and uh, I'm studying a master in renewable energy. It has always been my dream to complete my studying. Uh, as me, as girl, it's an opportunity for complete study and also to be a tough girl. It's really because now uh, I become an uh, independent uh, girl uh, to work, uh, to, to be involved in, in society. You all want to come back. That's why we are maintaining to be students. And we are not running away from the war, no. We are trying to face it by our education. Knowledge, it's a weapon. It's the smart weapon, a peaceful weapon. And I wish every student or who really wants to complete and to search uh, to get this a chance. Food is important, safety is important, and life expenses, all of it, it's very important. But in the meantime, we should not forget to build this children. If you build a person, you build a community, community will build a country. Good evening. Boa noite. Bem-vindo ao Fundação Jean Palimo. Outra vez, peço desculpa pelo, atras pelo atraso. And sorry again for the delay. My name's Anna. I'm a PhD student here in the Jean Palimo Neuroscience Program, and I'll be your host for tonight. The video you've just seen is a short documentary about the global platform for Syrian students, an organization set up by the former Portuguese president, Jorge Sampaio, who we're delighted to have with us in the audience tonight and later on, you'll hear him speaking to you. The work of the platform was the inspiration for the event that you've come to see today, Rebuilding from Conflict, the Power of Education in Emergencies. So to begin the event, I'd like to ask the president of the Champalimo Foundation, Leonel Beleza, to come to the stage to say a few words. Thank you, Anna. President George Sampaio, Secretary Fernanda Hall, ambassadors, speakers, guests, organizers, students, in particular Syrian students. This is a very special edition of our R events. R, the Portuguese word which means air, what we need to breathe. Today, an initiative of the, 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 the R events are an initiative uh, on a regular basis of the Champalimo Research, our research program. And today, this edition is 
co-organized with the Global Platform for Syrian Students, created and chaired by President George Sampaio, to allow university students from war-torn Syria to pursue their education abroad. Our events aim to bring science to a non-specialized public and have been taking place for more than four years now. The Global Platform for Syrian Students has brought more than 100 students to Portugal and some other countries where universities have been integrating them successfully since 2014. This event today will, as always, focus on the scientifically relevant facts and data in a certain area. Today, the one related to the importance of the presence of highly educated nationals in post-conflict societies. But it encompasses a broader perspective I would like to stress. Firstly, although we will not be directly speaking about the refugee crisis that is spreading and growing in Europe, we cannot in any way ignore the current political and social situation which has changed dramatically in Europe since President George Sampaio launched the platform. We cannot today think separately about these issues, but the relevance of education towards reconstruction has always been there, as would be the case if the refugee crisis were not among all of us now. Secondly, this meeting also was convened with a humanitarian dimension raising awareness towards the plight of young Syrians who, besides being subject to the most unthinkable risks and dangers, see the future being individually and collectively stolen from the ones who will survive because schools, universities, and any kind of education institution have been disrupted in their day-to-day -day life. We are all very aware of the situation of thousands of people fleeing the Syrian war and the threats to their lives. But maybe we need to understand that even when the war, the war finishes and people are allowed to stay or to go back to their country, they will need the education and the expertise of thousands who could not use their normal education years for the purpose all children and young people should be entitled to. Understanding this and playing a role in receiving and helping them now is the best thing we can do to hope for a working country in the years ahead. This is what President George Sampaio realized before almost anyone else. And this is the challenge he chose for himself, using his unique reputation and experience to build from scratch a program to help young people find institutions and countries where they could finish their higher education and prepare themselves for the gigantic tasks that lie ahead in their future. I feel very proud that this project was created by a distinguished Portuguese and that my country could show wisdom and initiative in such a critical situation before the shores of Europe made everyone realize the extent of the suffering in the Middle East. We are honored in the Champalimo Foundation by the presence of President George Sampaio and proud to welcome the superb speakers today, Drs. Joe Biel and Sultan Barakat, as well as Syrian students who will today speak to us all. I thank the Global Platform and I thank our R team for organizing this evening and hope that it will allow all of us some moments of enriching exchanges and of enlightening experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Beleza. Well, I was going to use a bit of time now to give you an introduction to our events and about how we came to, the pla how we came to this idea of, of putting on this event, Rebuilding from Conflict. Well, I think uh, Dr. Beleza just gave you already a, a taste of what an R event is, but maybe I'll just go into a bit more detail. 
So uh, it's an initiative, as was already said, run by the students and researchers from the Champalabon Bon Neuroscience Program. We put on events like these for the public, and we take a central theme and we try and explore it from different ways and different angles. One of these angles is normally scientific, since we're scientists. But the others, well, they can be many different ways of looking at the world. So for instance, here on the stage, we've had artists, uh, musicians, politicians, once even a chef. And we combined these different ways of looking at the world, and we think that we can get some new perspective on the central question then by looking at that. But tonight, as you've already heard, our, our aim for this event is a little bit more than just that. The humanitarian crisis in Syria now is escalating. And more than 11 million Syrians, that's more than the entire population of Portugal, have been forced to flee their homes. So to give you an idea of, of the background of this event, some months ago, a few of us in Ard were, were talking about this and wondering if there was anything, any small thing that we could do to help. One of my colleagues had read a newspaper article about a Portuguese platform that was concentrating on higher education. So we got in contact with the Secretary General of the platform, Dr. Elena Bajorku, who's also here with us in the audience tonight, and uh, to find out a little bit more about what they did. And we were all very inspired when we heard about the work. As you've already heard, uh, the platform brings students out of Syria and places them at countries worldwide. In fact, I have a graphic here just so you can see. So there are now more than 140 students placed in 10 countries worldwide um, in three continents. And I know that in the future, they hope to extend this. Uh, they hope to have more scholarships for more students and be able to place them uh, elsewhere. When I, when I heard about this, I felt like the philosophy of the platform really was about investing in the future for a country. As will have been obvious to you from the video, there are many, many functions in society for which a higher education is absolutely vital. From the obvious ones like uh, medicine or dentistry or engineering, to others which are also very important for the culture of a country or for its well-being, like studies in literature or in music or in social sciences. Without people to fulfill these roles, even after a conflict is over, a country will face huge difficulties to be rebuild. So even in the midst of the immediate crises, as was already mentioned, that face refugees, without investment now in higher education, the repercussions of the war or another crisis will last for decades to come. So in Ar, when we heard about this, we were very inspired and, and we, I think we felt a, a real accord with these students who were stranded in the sense that here in the Jean-Paulman Neuroscience Program, there are also many, many foreign students. I myself came from England uh, six years ago to study for my PhD here. Of course, I wouldn't want to compare my situation to that of the Syrian students because I was in the extremely privileged position to be able to choose when to leave my country and where to go. But still, I think that there are some universal experiences which are shared by everybody who, who goes to abroad to work or to study. And later on, you'll hear from three of the students who uh, have scholarships from the Global Platform and who are studying in Lisbon about their experiences here and what it means to them to have a scholarship. For my own part, I can tell you that coming here to Lisbon has been a, a unique experience. When I was applying, I, I'd heard about this very exciting new institute, and it was going to open up on the banks of the Rio Tejo. And it was aiming to offer cutting edge neuroscience and also promote friendship and collaboration between the people who were working there. And I thought, that sounds great. I'm going to go, I'll learn neuroscience, I'll get a suntan, which in England is not so easy to do, uh, and I'll become fluent in Portuguese straight away. Well, six years later, uh, I'm still grappling with some of the complexities of Portuguese grammar as you can probably tell by my mistake at the beginning of this event. But in other ways, I've, I've learned so much more than I could possibly have imagined. The Champalabon -Bon Neuroscience Program turned out to be a melting pot of people from all over the world, from different nationalities, from different backgrounds, both scientific and cultural. Here, I have another graphic. Uh, this is just to show you the diversity of people at the Champalabon -Bon Neuroscience Program. This is from 2015. And you can see that there are 33 nationalities from five different continents. So it's a real, real mixture. And I can say that being in a place like this, with so many different people, and without the support of old family and friends to fall back on, has really broadened my horizons hugely. It's made me question and reassess some of the things 
the values or the ideas that I took for granted before. And I can safely say that this has been a huge benefit to me as a person, and I think as a citizen of the world. But now I want to consider the fact that it's not surprising that an academic community is so diverse. The goal of academia, it's really to be a global enterprise. It spans across countries. It has very little regard for nationality. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that academia strives to be a global enterprise, to make a borderless society. I think this isn't really very surprising when you consider the fact that what academia wants to do is push back the boundaries of human knowledge to push back borders, and the borders of country and of nationality are often the first to go. We here, we researchers in the Champalaman Neuroscience Program, we've benefited hugely from being part of this global family. And we also take for granted the ability to move between different parts of this world, so to be able to exchange ideas and to learn new things. And any barriers that are put in place to this, any way that this is, this is not possible, whether these barriers be economic, political, ideological, or any others, can only hinder the progress which is so important for our society. Me and my colleagues at the Champalama Neuroscience Program have really had the trajectory, the trajectory of our lives defined by the university studies we did. And I believe, or at least let's say I wish, that this opportunity to study, to learn, to push back the, the field of your knowledge uh, and of the boundaries of your subject was available to everybody, regardless of the country or the circumstances they were born into. Living in a country which happens to be at war shouldn't be a reason to be denied this opportunity. And I also think that it's the responsibility of those of us lucky enough to live in a place of peace and prosperity to extend our help and our fellowship to those in hardship. To this end, uh, we also, we're running a funding campaign alongside this event. So the, um, the website that you can donate at is there. It's this ppl.com. And uh, so you can donate there any time in the next month. And um, at, there's also some computers outside, so you can make, if you're so inspired, you can make your donation straight away. And I actually just want to make a bit of a plug for the funding campaign. And I want to talk especially to people in the audience who've had a higher education. And I want you just to think about what that meant for your life and how your life might have been different had you been denied that opportunity. And if your life would have been different, then maybe you'll be moved just to make a donation, however big or small you can, so that other people who otherwise would be denied this opportunity can have the same chances that you did. But now, back to the event. So as I told you before, our events are about exploring a topic from different angles. So we've convened a, a prestigious uh, panel of speakers for you tonight who are going to talk about this topic, rebuilding from conflict from different angles. First of all, uh, we have Professor Sultan Barakat from York University and the Brookings Center in Doha. And he'll talk about barriers to reconstruction after a conflict. Next, Dr. Joe Bial from the British Council will tell us how education can benefit conflict and post-conflict societies. Next, we have uh, three students, three of the Syrian students who have scholarships from the platform, shown here with Dr. Elena Bahoku. And they're going to tell you a little bit about their lives here uh, about what it's meant for them to have a scholarship. And at this point, we're going to have a round table. So I hopefully you'll all have many questions after the speakers have, have done their talks. Uh, you won't be able to ask them directly after the talk, but you'll, you can ask them in the round table. So there's a phone number there, which I'm sure you can see, or an email address. Anytime during the event, you can submit your questions uh, to this phone number or email address. Uh, we'll collect them and we'll ask as many as we can during this round table. And finally, uh, President Jorge Sampaio, the head of the Global Platform, will give a closing address. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Sultan Barakat to the stage. <laughs> Dr. Barakat is the Director of Research at the Brookings Door Center and a Senior Fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy. In 1993, he founded the Post-War Reconstruction and Development Unit, a world-leading center at the University of York. His current research focus is state fragility and recovery in the Middle East. Professor Barakat has over 25 years of professional experience working on issues of conflict management, humanitarian response, and post-conflict recovery and transition. We're very happy to have you here tonight. Thank you, Anna.
Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I should start by um, thanking the Foundation for the very kind invitation. It's a great privilege to be amongst, uh, I think, the largest group of scientists I've ever been uh, with. And uh, uh, I hope that we will uh, reach some uh, common understanding in some of the areas I'm going to address. Um, I would also like to particularly thank uh, Madam President uh, Maria Beleza for, for the invitation and for the great work that the Foundation does. President Jorge Sampaio has become a friend over the last year and a half and a great source of uh, inspiration. Uh, just minutes uh, earlier, he was asking, what keeps you going in this subject? I've been at it for about 25 years. I've worked in Afghanistan, in Palestine, in Yemen, in East Africa, in Southeast Asia, you name it. And um, I think the one thing that keeps me going is the fact that, A, as a Palestinian refugee, I benefited from education, and I would like to put something back in the system. But also, I aspire for, to have a better future for my children. So my hope has always been that if we can collectively do something better, why not? Let's try and, and, and uh, experiment and see what could happen. 25 years ago, I set up the Post-War Reconstruction and Development Unit and started to get students sponsored by colleagues and friends to come out of Afghanistan. 25 years later, I go to Kabul, and there is something called the Yorkistan, uh, which is uh, a, a collection of, of leaders who are in the country, ranging from close advisors to the president, to cabinets, to the national security advisor now, the former minister of finance, and, and the former minister of rural rehabilitation, and many others. Now, they haven't been as lucky in terms of getting the country back on its feet, but I don't think it was entirely their fault. At least they were willing to pick up some skills to go back home and to try their best to rebuild and to participate in the reconstruction of, of their country. Uh, in my presentation uh, tonight, I will focus on some of those tricky areas that does not allow people in those contexts to realize their uh, ideal dream of reconstruction uh, and rebuilding. To start with, I think we're all in agreement on the importance of higher education in general and in development. Many developing countries, OECD countries, rely significantly in terms of GDP on their institutions of higher education. They, they rely on generating knowledge, on creating patterns, on selling ideas, and so on. Uh, and it has been a driving force in Southeast Asia for a lot of developments in countries like uh, Korea and, and the Asian Tigers, as well as more recently in uh, China. In the Arab world, the story is slightly different. And I think it's important before we start talking about the war damage to, uh, to acknowledge some of the realities of higher education in the Arab world. Uh, traditionally and historically, we had some of the very first universities established in the Arab world the so-called Houses of Wisdom of uh, Kairawan, Cairo, Baghdad, uh, Damascus, uh, predated uh, many institutions in Europe and, and of, of course, uh, Northern, Northern America. They've had their roots in, in uh, religious beliefs and in uh, religious institutions, but they almost always broke away and tried to distance the clerics and the religion, and they took a much more a pragmatic, almost secular in some cases, understanding of, of the world. And that has led to the advancement of science and social sciences and humanities in the Arab world that later came to Europe uh, after the Dark Ages. Now, many distinguishing factors about this history uh, exist, but the one factor I would like to highlight is many of those universities were endowed, based on endowments and the endowments were set up by women, which is something that we do not necessarily acknowledge these days, but the great learning house of al Qairawan was set up by, by a woman, Al-Azhar University, the same. Uh, moving on from that golden age and focusing only on the last 200 years, higher education played an important role in, in the development in the region, but with a mixed bag. Uh, 
we have institutions such as the American University of Beirut. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's celebrating 150 years this year. It was one of the first leading modern universities in the region. The University of Cairo predated that. The University of Baghdad, again Damascus. And in the early uh, 20th century, there were genuine places for exchanges of, of ideas and uh, freedom of expression and, and some uh, a greater degree of scientific development and so on. Things took um, a U-turn, uh, unfortunately, following some of the uh, post-colonial era and the many projects of nation building and state building where higher education institutions were literally hijacked by single political parties and they started to want to dominate the structure in the hope to build a particular form of state. And that produced a certain output in terms of education and, and education culture in, in our region. Uh, things took another turn to the worse, I think, in the 1990s and 2000s, in that in, across the, the region, we started to focus more on numbers rather than quality. Higher education was seen as a way to address unemployment or at least to hide unemployment. More people were to be brought through the education system uh, in the hope of social mobility. Some were successful, some were not. Higher education institutions were created in some very odd places. If you go to Libya and you see the universities in the middle of nowhere being created to, to uh, satisfy the demands of uh, heads of tribes or municipalities. Uh, something similar happened in Jordan. And the little by little, they lost the tradition and the need for, for research. And uh, we turned many, many institutions into basically teaching institutions, no more, no less, uh, to, the, to the effect that uh, today, if you look at the um, top ranking of universities, and I know rankings are always problematic, but if you take the Times Higher Education ranking, of the top 400 universities, there's only one in the Arab world, and that one is in Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah University, despite the fact that there is 370 million people live in the region with many more than, many more universities, um, I don't know, 400, 500 schools exist across the region. So quality has taken a back seat. We focus a lot on, on numbers. And with the liberal economics uh, coming in, uh, we started to, to compromise even the quality of teaching in some institutions to make up the numbers to justify the funding. And many universities have had uh, to cope with parallel systems where in the morning students go who, who gained a place because of their grades and in the afternoon uh, the students who have paid for the place, or in some cases, they get mixed in the same classroom. Now, politically, those moves have helped create certain momentum in different countries, but collectively, I think it drove the culture of education back uh, many years and has, has, has uh, created this, this very problematic uh, proposition that we have today. Adding to this uh, rather miserable picture of higher education uh, is the conflict that have ravaged the, the region in the last few years. Uh, many institutions, and starting from 2003 with the invasion of, uh, of Iraq, uh, many institutions of, of higher education were directly affected, physically damaged, populations were displaced, capacities eroded because of displacement, and of course, whatever little finance existed uh, dedicated for higher education became even less and, uh, and, and things became much more complicated. And in countries, in particular cases like Iraq, for example, you should look at this, that it happened to them on the back of a sanctions of, of 10 plus years, which led to uh, almost uh, no books, uh, journals, very little connections to the outside world existed in the country. And, all, and it led to uh, the um, shrinking, really, of the space of thinking in, in, uh, in those environments. The one space that suffered most, I think, is the space related to social sciences, humanities, and concepts of toleration. 
you know, the, the, in the early 70s, early 80s, when I studied at, at, uh, in Jordan, because we had no political parties outside campus, it was the politics were played on campuses. We could elect our uh, representatives. We had student representatives. There were people who represented the Islamic movement, the liberals, the seculars, the lefties, the communists, all sorts of colors. Because democracy wasn't allowed on the streets and people could not engage openly. Unfortunately, in some systems, like in Syria and Iraq, uh, that wasn't possible. The only person you can engage with would be al-Mukhabarat or the intelligence person representing the state on campus, and that's it. Now, this has bottled people up for, for years and years and years in terms of the need to express. And as you know, universities, and the Arab world is not uh, an exception, are the hotbeds for political ideas and, and, and political developments uh, always between professors and students and the dialogue that were happening. Those dialogues, unfortunately, were not, were not, we were not able to have them in the open in, in many contexts within the Middle East. Uh, particular pr brutality was demonstrated during the Iraq war. The campaigns against uh, Gaza, repeated bombing of Gaza. The last war, 500 students roughly were, were killed. Uh, and of course, uh, the miserable situation that we, we witness today in, in Syria, and recently the war on, on Yemen. Just to illustrate uh, one point about the way the societies in those civil wars tend to polarize uh, and squeeze out anyone who may think differently, this figure illustrates the number of, of professors killed in Iraq between 2003 and 2009. They've practically been assassinated. They're assassinated because they would not fit one side or the other. They refuse to go Shia or Sunni. They refuse to go left or right. And what war does to, to the society, it does really pull it apart. And you have to make a choice and you have to make a stand that is public and, and so on. Those who refused were, were, were either pushed out through displacement or in many cases were, uh, were killed. And that brings really the importance of what President Sampaio and others do in this field. The, the absolute important uh, work to try and rescue and offer a second opportunity for academics as well as students so that not all is, is lost in terms of, of the uh, uh, possibilities for reconstruction in, in, in their countries and in their region. Two things happen simultaneously in many of those contexts. The increased targeting of higher education on the one side is pulling the higher education to one direction, and also it's combined by a general failure to acknowledge the, the importance of investing in higher education. The result of that really is that we, we do very little in the immediate context of, of post-war in, in some of those regions. If you, uh, like me, study post-conflict reconstruction, you get exposed to a lot of uh, strategies, ranging from humanitarian uh, intervention to development. There are things that are related to peace building, early recovery, stabilization, counterinsurgency, and so on. Many, many strategies. And these are the complexity of those strategies imposed on those countries. And in none of them, you see any reference ever to higher education. It's almost uh, taken for granted that somehow some people will turn up from somewhere and put this country back together. And very little recognition is being given to the people who, uh, who belong to that country and need to do the work uh, of reconstruction. Sorry. And I think we need to do a few things, and I'll just illustrate some of those uh, general ideas. Uh, the first and most important is to invest more in, in protection during conflict. And the first step to protect during conflict is to recognize that many of those institutions, despite their deficiencies academically, they have a degree of resilience and they can survive the conflict. And it's absolutely amazing to see some students having to cross uh, fr uh, front lines in order to attend classes and come back. We have very good examples from the uh, Lebanese civil war 
uh, of, the, of the way people continued education despite the intense conflict uh, around them. And we know that the university in, in, in many parts of Syria, university is still operational uh, as well as under uh, ISIS uh, today in Raqqa. Now, that is not enough on its own. We need to try and invest more in strengthening uh, legal uh, instruments for, for protection of higher education. A lot has been done in terms of strengthening the legal instruments for basic education, and that ought to be extended and expanded to include higher, ed higher education. We need to find a way in which an international mechanism can be created to be able to monitor, understand, and, and design responses re relatively quickly in, in a kind of rapid response uh, way to try and, and aid universities uh, in, in those uh, circumstances. Uh, and I genuinely believe that we also need to try and find as much as possible solutions within the region. And I know that this is maybe slightly controversial for those who have had the opportunity to come and study in Europe, but I think the scale of the problem does not allow us to encourage too much of protection and uh, uh, moving scholars from, from within the, the Middle East to, to come uh, in Europe. Uh, I think the Middle East should carry its own response, share of the responsibility and we should try and encourage people to, to stay within the region if at all possible. And for that to happen, there should be some serious investments to improve education system as a whole within, within the, the region. I'm conscious that the time, I'm giving a signal that it's, I'm running out of time, but uh, the second point is, is really about finance. This is always problematic. It's very uh, easy to, to think uh, about what could happen, but when it comes to actual uh, financing, it's, it's really uh, tough to uh, think in terms of what systems uh, can, can be created to, to finance the very expensive work of reconstruction. This diagram is from uh, Iraq, and as you can see, often the pledge is, is much greater than what is dispersed to the country, despite the political interest in that particular country. And only a few countries would be willing to invest seriously in, in higher education uh, in, any, in any one context. I, I'm not sure who will step uh, forward for Syria, but these are the countries that have stepped forward for Iraq, and, and this is the contribution that was made over the years. One uh, pattern that we've observed again and again is that uh, the amount of resources and interest uh, sort of rises uh, during the crisis, and then the moment the, there's a solution for the crisis, it starts to drop sharply, and it more or less follows the attention of, by, given by the media. And that, unfortunately, goes exactly opposite to the reconstruction needs of higher education. Higher education starts asking for very little at the beginning. People, students just want access, they want their lecturer back, they want uh, basic uh, classrooms. But as you engage in higher education, and if you want to do it properly with research and investment and so on, the needs are much, much greater. And within no time, a gap will develop between what is on offer, what is available either nationally or internationally, and what, student, what the uh, sector requires. Similarly, in terms of capacity of higher education, uh, the capacity starts at a reasonable level to start with in the conflict, and then either staff are being killed or displaced, uh, and they don't return, and it drops. And we found repeatedly that the capacity is lowest when you have most money and most interest in the reconstruction of, of a particular country. And then it starts building up through training programs, education, people returning back, and so on. But again, they face the same dilemma. By the time we have a degree of local capacity, there is very little interest internationally to support the system. Now, that does require us to think in, 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 uh, in new ways, and I think the one idea that I know President Sampaio is, 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 is looking for is the creation of an international fund. The, we are desperately needing uh, a trust fund that can capture the interest and the resources when they are available, and then allow it to be phased in as and when the circumstances change and the capacity uh, improves. Uh, the last 
point I'd like uh, to make really is in relation to, to um, the importance of uh, social sciences and humanities. Uh, I mentioned earlier that in the Arab world, maybe we haven't given sufficient uh, uh, focus on, 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 on those subjects. And I hope in the reconstruction that we uh, address that particular uh, problem. Uh, the reason why ISIS is able to hijack uh, a religion like Islam and come up with all those ideologies is really because we haven't done our research on the other side uh, sufficiently. The so-called moderates, the people who understand the book, etc., etc. We do not invest in philosophy. We do not invest in religious studies. Usually, those who get lowest marks in any society, in any country, Arab world, they go and study religious studies. And then they come to the, out as the clerics who have to dicta dictate to you how you do your life and so on. Very little investment is going in that uh, sector. And I think without investing more in the social sciences and the humanities, we will always be going on a one-legged race towards development and it won't work. We will find ourselves again and again in a situation where do not, we do not tolerate each other, we cannot communicate with each other, we do not dialogue with each other and we do not allow space for one, or one another. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity and I'm sorry if I've run out of time. Thank you very much, Professor Barakat. As I said before, you'll have a chance to ask questions uh, by sending them to these, in these two methods um, and, you'll, and then we can ask them to Dr. Barakat later in the evening. So now I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Jo Bial. Uh, she's the Director of Education and Society and a member of the Executive Board of the British Council. A graduate of the London School of Economics, her past roles include the Professor of Development Studies at LSE and Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. She's a specialist in international education, international development, and cities in fragile and conflict situations. Her work has taken her to Africa, Asia and Latin America, with extensive periods of research in Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, and South Africa. She has written numerous books and articles on a wide range of topics, including governance and civil society, women in development, and cities in fragile states. Welcome, Dr. Beale. So, um, good evening everyone and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here it's a huge pleasure and uh, thank you uh, President Salpayo and uh, Dr. Beleze for your presence and for inviting me. I'm going to um, talk today um, in, in two ways. One, I'm, I'm going to say something about history. I'm going to refer to history, both the history of uh, some of the work we've done in the British Council, but also history that other organizations have been involved in around the whole issue of um, higher education in situations of conflict, fragility, um, and emergencies. Because I think there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to be optimistic about if we take the long view and we see uh, some of the um, outcomes of that history. I'm also going to um, locate that discussion in a little bit of current context and say a little bit too about my own personal experience uh, growing up uh, and studying in Africa. So I'll talk from uh, the point of view of the UK, British Council, um, uh, and, and beyond. So I think the first thing, just to lay a bit of context, in 70 countries in the last five years, schools, universities, colleges, their students, their teachers have been intentionally targeted for attack. All education facilities have been taken over by the military. 70 countries in the world at the moment. Education is seen as a, an absolute priority in humanitarian crises, and yet it only receives 2% of humanitarian aid. So I think those two um, issues are uh, important to bear in mind. UNHCR, which is the UN Refugee Agency, is currently responsible at the moment for the largest number of refugees 
in the world since World War II. That's a huge number of uh, people who are on the move. And in addition, there are internally displaced people. So when we look at those numbers, we also have to realize that many of them, many of those people on the move, either within their own countries and regions or globally, are on the move, are displaced, are disrupted from their normal lives as a result of crises that have lasted at least a decade. 90% of conflicts that have occurred in the 21st century are in countries that have already experienced a civil war. People who are living in conditions of displacement, many have been doing so for over 10 years. Now, I make this point in a way to reinforce uh, what Professor Barakat said uh, before me, which is it's no longer really appropriate to think of humanitarian crises as the kind of interventions you make when there's an emergency and international development aid, which is something you deliver when you want a long-term, sustainable, and protracted outcome. Those two things have come together. They are meshed just because humanitarian crises are so protracted, so enduring. The other contextual thing that I'd like to just point out is that of the crises that we are engaged in or are witnessing at the moment. The displaced people, the majority um, of the increase is the result of crises in just a few places. Iraq, South Sudan, Syria, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Nigeria. And these five countries account for 60% of new displacements worldwide where people have fled from their homes. The sharp boundary between humanitarian aid and development is becoming fuzzy. The boundary is fuzzy. But also, I would posit that uh, the boundary between international development or aid, um, as we understood it under the Millennium Development Goals, and d international development as we understand it now in the Sustainable Development Goals, means that there is a shift in the way we look at development, and there is a much closer relationship between development and what we do in the British Council, which is something we call cultural relations. And when we talk about cultural relations, we talk about a very long-term, enduring, mutual relationship between the UK and the countries where we work. And I'm going to come back to that, because I think international development is going to require much more of a cultural relations approach. In order to illustrate this, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a bit of history. Um, we have been here before and we've responded. This, this uh, slide illustrates two things. On the left, you've got people walking for hunger in London during the economic crisis of 1932. And on the right, uh, German troops passing through cheering crowds, waving the Nazi flag in March 1938, both pre-World War II images. Now, interestingly, the British Council was set up at around this time. It was set up to counter fascism. It was set up at a time when uh, Britain felt under threat. It wanted a new role for itself in the world. We weren't the only ones. The Institut Francais was doing the same thing, the Goethe Institute. Across Europe, institutes were being set up to deal with, uh, to engage with people-to-people -people encounters at a time when war was brewing. Um, and at that time, we set up the British Council School in Madrid. It was set up, it was known as El British. Uh, it was set up the year that we received our Royal Charter in 1940. And it was explicitly set up one year 
after Franco came to power in Spain. Now, the British school in Madrid focused on British values, but it didn't preach British values. It engaged in just the kinds of social science focus that uh, Professor Barakat was talking about, the critical thinking, uh, looking at the world from different perspectives. Um, it was about creating dialogue, friendship between countries, um, but keeping that open-mindedness going. And I think the British Council School in Madrid, which is still going, um, is an interesting example of what we might do in the university space. Not we as British Council, but we as a global community. But moving on, um, in terms of our history, uh, the British Council went on in very difficult contexts and very difficult places uh, to carry on creating a friendly knowledge and understanding between people of the UK and uh, abroad. And this is one of our libraries in uh, South Asia. And we offered convening spaces, uh, places for people to come together uh, and to talk. Um, and still today, we work in uh, fragile states, in conflict areas, and we uh, carry on uh, promoting uh, education. I'm going to turn now to why I think it's important um, that we focus on, on higher education. And I think uh, I'm not going to dwell in a huge amount of detail because I think Professor Barakat's covered uh, many of the points. But a lot of the work uh, where people are focusing on education in crisis situations, that focuses on schools, uh, on educating people um, in refugee camps. Higher education is the Cinderella area, and yet it is the most important. And I think it's most important for four reasons. The first is around academic freedom and intellectual autonomy. The freedom uh, to produce curiosity-driven research, to follow inquiry and knowledge for the sake of it. Uh, we are in the center of the unknown to explore the unknown. And often in refugee situations, in crisis and emergency situations, that gets lost. We're all about providing skills, getting people into jobs. I think we have to think about that curiosity-driven research. But the second thing is young people are um, in camps and they're bored and potentially at risk of uh, being radicalized. I think the third reason we need to look at higher education is the reconstruction of higher education systems um, in post-conflict situations. And then um, lastly, I'm going to say something um, about scholars at risk, or maybe first say something about scholars at risk. And this is the second bit of history. And this is not British Council history. This is a, an organization um, which now is, has been called CARA for a long time. Um, the letters, the acronym stood for something else, was the uh, Council for um, Refugee Academics, Assistance to Refugee Academics. It's now the Council for At-Risk Academics because at-risk academics are not only refugees, they are not only mobile, they may be in region, as again, as uh, Professor Barakat uh, pointed out. Now, this organization, which is still going strong, was also set up in uh, Europe in the 1930s um, as uh, academic refugees were fleeing out of Nazi Germany. Among them, um, there were 16 Nobel Prize winners in the 30s and 40s that were rescued uh, and supported by this organization. Many of them became members of the Royal Society. Many of them became um, uh, leaders of important uh, departments in universities. It was set up to focus on individual academics. It was the, an Einstein his last address in Europe before he went to the States was at a meeting, a fundraiser 
uh, for this organization. Now, I make the point um, about CARA because we can't lose sight of the individuals, the, Ein the potential Einsteins in the camps, in, on the road, in the boats. We have to bear in mind that there are individual people of intellectual worth and curiosity that we do have to rescue. But the point that Einstein made in 1933 was we need also to go beyond the individuals and save the right, save the opportunity of academic freedom. Because so often, in contexts of crisis, in contexts of conflict and war, it is the very heart of ac academic freedom uh, that gets targeted and universities get targeted. We know that in the many camps, um, not only in Syria, uh, or, or on Syrian borders, uh, not only in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and, and so on, but across the world in camps, there are many university students, former university students, or students of university going age. And their lives have been disrupted. So there are the beginnings of some efforts uh, to reach students in these camps. This picture is of the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, which is near the Somalian border. And I show it because here was a very small, not very successful opportunity um, to develop MOOCs. I don't know how many of you have heard of MOOCs, massive open online courses. Um, not very successful, but a, an attempt to try and bring education uh, to the camps. A lot of the focus um, on higher education is in, interestingly, uh, at the moment, and in the Middle East, North African region, looking at whether uh, introducing the social sciences, improving humanities and social science education can counter extremism. The evidence is very slim, but what we do know is that when you have critical thinking, when you have um, analysis rather than just broadcast, uh, you, have, you give people the opportunity to make up their own minds uh, about what they see, what they hear from religious leaders, what they get on the social media uh, and on the internet. So higher education is absolutely critical to keep those questioning minds open. Uh, the penultimate thing I'm going to say is uh, that we need to focus on higher education for the whole purpose of reconstruction. I won't dwell on this uh, because Professor Barakat has also uh, spoken on this. But this is a picture of the damage done to University of Damascus in 2013. The people that we are here to talk about, to help, uh, to rally behind are the people who are going to reconstruct. And here I just want to bring uh, a quick uh, anecdote from my experience in South Africa, where I was um, a deputy vice chancellor at the uh, University of Cape Town. And we had many aid people, many universities, a number of uh, international visitors coming through, and they were all interested in what we could do at University of Cape Town to uh, meet job market requirements, to make people employable, and all of that was very important, to get the next uh, generation of uh, engineers and doctors out there across the African continent. But the University of Cape Town also wanted to produce its research. It also wanted to pursue pure curiosity-driven research, and it also had a lot to offer in terms of that research, infectious diseases, all sorts of areas where uh, expertise was rich. And I think as we look to rebuilding the institutions of learning um, in the uh, countries of, of um, Middle East and North Africa, we need to think about that as well. And I think I will leave it at there. Um, that slide was just to really just represent uh, the huge wealth of goodwill. When I go to universities around the UK, students are wanting 
to do something. They're wanting to support. So what we do need to do is think about how we can corral that goodwill, that uh, willingness to um, provide solidarity and backing to students uh, from conflict-affected areas um, and to give them channels in which to um, operate. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Beale. I'd now like to invite to the stage all the roundtable participants. Um, it would be great if you could come up now. So um, for the roundtable, you've already met uh, Dr. Barakat and Dr. Beale, who'll be there. Um, we're also very happy to have with us um, President George Sampaio, who will be joining us for the round table. Um, George Sampaio graduated in law at Lisbon University in 1961. During the country's dictatorship, he took up a legal career and became a Law Association board member, playing an important role in the defense of political prisoners. After 1974, he held several political positions in the new Portuguese democracy as a member of the Socialist Party. In 1989, he was elected mayor of Lisbon and re-elected in 1993. He was elected twice as president of Portugal between 1996 and 2006. During the last decade, President Sampaio has given his input to several issues related to European affairs and to many challenges currently facing the international community such as pandemics like HIV, drugs, children, human rights, and East Timor. He was the first UN Special Envoy to stop tuberculosis and the first UN High Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations and is now leading the global platform for Syrian students. He's a member of the CGI, the Club of Madrid, and of the Global Commission on Drugs Policy and is on the Board of Trustees of the Carnegie Corporation in New York and a member of the Clinton Global Initiative. In July 2015, he was jointly awarded the UN Mandela Prize for the very first time in the United Nations history. So could you show your appreci appreciation, please, for President Sampaio? <laughs> and we also have here on stage three of the scholars from the Global Platform for Syrian Students who are going to introduce themselves in their own words. Good night, everybody. I'm William Kinan from Damascus, Syria. I'm doing a Master in Knowledge and Decision System. I've been here since October 2014, and I must say, I'm not even close to the person I was at that time. Before I came to Portugal, I applied to many scholarships. I was on the reserve list for three Erasmus scholarships. Usually, Erasmus selects five master students. Out of all the students, in, in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine. I was also accepted to study at Manchester University, but I didn't find fundings. At the end, I was lucky because Global Platform chose me. I would like to thank Global Platform for this great opportunity. When I came to Portugal, I got the chance to interact with, diff with people from different cultures. And this culture experience and culture exchange is extremely important, in my opinion, especially for Syrian people nowadays, because we not just get to know and respect other cultures, we can see how these cultures respect each other and how they deal with their differences. Let's face the truth. Ignoring other people's opinion is the heart of the problem in Syria. And having people and especially students to continue their studies in these civilized communities is part of the solution. In the school, we have students from many countries, Italy, France, Mozambique, USA, etc., whatever. And we became friends, honestly lifelong friends. That allowed me to be exposed to different tradition, different way of thinking, different opinion, different personalities. And this is not just good for me, it's good for the community I came from. It's communities that makes difference, not individual words. Another word I would like to talk about is the, is the impact of this scholarship on me on a personal level. I improved my English very much and I've already started learning Portuguese. 
there is no way I can say how important it is for any person and for his or her career later on in the future to learn a foreign language. Also here, I'm able to travel to almost all European countries, and I've already visited some of them. I enjoyed new museum, new landscapes, new arts. I discovered some interest for me, and maybe for other students, they may have discovered new talents. All these experiences account to make us more mature and more responsible. Here, of course, we need to focus on our studies and at the same time, have fun and enjoy all these new cultures. And manage to have all that according to our budget. This makes us more mature. Let me tell you something really important to me. There are things that books can't teach you, simply can't. For instance, being patient. When we are here having fun and at the same time hear bad news about Syria, which is unfortunately almost every mo moment. Sometimes about our own town where almost all our families still live. We can't do anything. We just need to be relaxed, calm, and hope that things will be better. All this makes us more mature. All this, in my opinion, build a person that can be in the future helpful for the Syrian people. In my opinion, my friends and I, after these two years here, and for some of them one year, are more beneficial for the Syrian student than before. The last thing I would like to highlight is the importance of this scholarship on me on the professional level. Here in Lisbon and in Portugal, I compete on international level. To get, for example, the internship I'm having right now, I had to work really hard, honestly really hard. And in the school, I'm challenged with people from different schools, from different countries, from different backgrounds, so I have to work honestly really hard again. This will definitely increase my knowledge and sooner or later will master my skills in the things I'm doing, not just for me, for all my friends, which sooner or later, somehow, someday, will reflect on Syria and on the Syrian people. Thank you very much for coming. Muito obrigado. I will give the floor to my friend. Hala. <laughs> Thank you, William. Boa noite a tudo. É, eu, eu, eu sou muito contente porque vocês estão aqui. Eu não vou falar português, eu vou falar inglês. My name is Ala Al Hariri. Of course, no one spells my name in the right way. So I have to spend like each five minutes from each new conversation trying to make people spell my name. I'm now a third year, I'm in my third year of architecture. Before five years, it happened to be the, I, it happened to be me, the youngest girl from four family member of economists, to break the stereotype and choose architecture as a field. After two years, I had to leave Syria, and I struggled through three continents, through three countries: Lebanon, Egypt, Turkey. After that. I had to struggle again with my family when I get the scholarship because my family was like many Syrians family, has concerns, has uh, afraid about their future, uh, the future of their children and also has a problem because of the visa issue. This time I didn't struggle alone. I st struggled with the platform, especially with Dr. Helena, which literally fought for me. It didn't work but I get another chance to be here in front of you. I've been told that I will be here to share stories, but actually I'm not story storytellers. I can tell you thousands of Syrian stories and bring you tears, but I am here to put you in new perspectives. First, education is really important for each society, for each member, especially Middle East, Middle East women. But the education is not enough. Sharing diversity is what, what makes our society build. It's the, the, the key to make our society more, again, uh, con uh, one unit. It's the, the key for the future. One day, 
when Dr. Helena tell me, Ala, would you like to share your living with the Portuguese family? I thought, that's really interesting. There is people on the other side of the world thinking about you. But I also think again, they took a step. And this is what I really want. And I took this chance and I learned. I learned a lot. I learned that life is not about right and wrong. It's about a new and different way of thinking. I also learned about history, food, culture, and I have my own version of speaking Portuguese. <laughs> yeah, that's the reality. And that was what not only me who changed, also my family. They start to convince other families of this existing of these chances. And small children seeing me as an example for the future. Mas eu tenho sorte. But others know. They, there are a lot of students struggling through visa issue, borders, family problem, running out of the, of the money. Everything is facing to them. They had hopes and dreams. But everything telling them there's no hope. Their hopes become dead hopes. So we need to move. We need to move urgently to solve this problem. It's part of the solution. Every time I meet someone and they ask me after a while, where are you from? I say, from Syria. They look at me in a way like, poor girl. No, please, I'm not a poor girl. I'm educated. I'm going to build the future. I'm going to make a change in each people, in each person's life. You don't know, maybe I'm going to be Zaha Hadid. Not only me, other students is going to make a change. Because I am here to tell, you, to tell you what happened and how can we make a change. Here from the center of the unknown, I'm here to make you know. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Ala. And yes, we are to Allah tonight. This is a very common name in Syria. And I came here trying to continue my speciality in gynecology and medicine. And when I was looking for a chance to continue my education, I was very lucky to accept it in this scholarship. And I wish there would be a place for any other Syrian student who is in the same place right now where I was two years ago. Giving this opportunity to continue the education is a great chance to have a certificate and higher education. And it's also about the idea of giving back the hope for a Syrian student who almost losing it. And by giving the hope back, you actually giving a life back. I hope when the day comes and we will be able to go to back to Syria again and rebuild it, we will not concentrate just on rebuilding the infrastructures and the destroyed buildings. We need to concentrate on the idea of rebuilding a healthy society again. And building such a society, starting from rebuilding the families. For me, coming here and noticing how much the people are living in harmony and peace and respecting each other, and maybe they even don't speak the same language in the European Union. While it's not the same case in many other regions of the world. This harmony here makes me feel and think and inspire me actually about the idea and how much important to rebuild the families and how much this will reflect positively on the future of having a healthy society and a healthy community Whereas in the, his, this community, there will be no place for hate, no place for judgment, just for respect. And I think, personally as a Syrian girl, focusing on the rule of women in this part is very important. And forcing this rule by educating the women on this value, and this woman in the future will have their own children and raise their own children about these values, the values of respecting each other differences, respecting each other opinion, and on the concept that the different 
is not bad, it's just different. By these values, we will have a new generation with a new way of thinking. And I think this generation will be able to rebuild Syria back again. It's a fact, as all of you know, in Syria, we are a very wide diversity. And even between two families, for example, in my case, and in contrast to many other Syrian families, I was more lucky by the support and encouragement of my family to continue my education till the end and to come here to Europe and continue my education. At last, let me seize this chance to thank the platform of the Syrian students, <laughs> President Dr. George Sambayo and Dr. Helena and Dr. Blazer for the organization today and the amazing team of the AR for, for organizing this event and for our dear guests who are coming today. Thank you so much. Bon night. Obrigada. Thank you very much. So now um, we'll start with the round table. And hopefully there have been some questions. Hopefully you've been submitting some questions. So let's see if uh, some of the questions are going to come up, if our technical wizardry has worked out OK. OK, so we have our first question here. Um, it's, this is uh, to anybody. Will we have a legal and regulatory framework in our higher education systems to quickly support these emergency situations from Luis? Um, perhaps I could ask our invited speakers, would they like to, to comment on this question? Um, well, to start with higher, higher education, like education, like much of the civil, civilian infrastructure, is protected under the uh, uh, Geneva Convention. Uh, Military should avoid the installations. It should not be part of the war. It should not be targeted, etc. But the reality of the conflict today is that that rule is not always observed, and there often uh, it's very easy to make the excuse why you had to target an installation uh, during a conflict. Now, I, if I understand this correctly, there, there is an interesting proposition here that we should have uh, the idea of of protection infused in institutions of higher education all over the world, which I tend to agree with. I think the uh, shootings that we often see uh, traumatizing community, uh, student communities in the United States, and, uh, in Africa, elsewhere, uh, should be uh, planned for, in, in the sense that we should, every university should have the mechanism to respond to an emergency within its uh, boundaries, but also, in addition to that, have the possibility to respond to an international crisis. And if we're able to organize that collectively across the university, I think it would be, it would be fantastic. Can you imagine a sort of a, um, a global agreement across higher education institutes all across the world? Do you think that's a realistic prospect? Our technical wizardry is failing us. We had a meeting last uh, June that led to the York Accord. And, and that, the idea of that, is, which was uh, chaired by uh, President Sampaio, the idea of that is to uh, start to get universities to agree on minimum uh, common standard you know, that they can uh, employ in these kind of situations. And I think the will is there. Uh, university administrations as a whole are uh, interested, they would like to engage. Uh, student societies are particularly interested and I think they're driving the decision quite often in, in universities. Uh, but uh, we need to do more. Uh, there is a need to, there are still lots of universities who f see themselves very distant from what's going on in the Middle East and elsewhere and it's not really on the list of uh, priorities to tackle today. Thank you. Maybe we'll move on to the next question. So, this is for the Syrian students. In what way would you like to contribute to the rebuilding of Syria's society? And this is from Raquel. William? Yeah. Uh, I could participate in rebuilding my country in my field of study. 
I can help in building what we call e-government. I've always studied in books what e-government is, but I never experienced it. When I came to Portugal here, I not just see, I not just study, I actually interact with what they call it e-government. Now I know what e-government is. If I get the chance to rebuild my country, it will be definitely through two things. First of all, building what we call e-government. Second, building content, digital content industry. The, the things that Syria doesn't have and almost all third world countries is the content. Yeah, maybe we can see the content online, but that content is not available. Sometimes that content is not good. But if we get, if we get digital content, like what we see in like UK universities or universities in USA or here in Portugal, it's digital content. It's specialized, it's, specialized, it's already studied by specialists. Uh, so it can be for any people. If I get, for example, a physical experiment using a digital content, I can use that content either in Syria and Afghanistan, in UK or on the moon. It's the same. The, the content is the same. So these two things I would participate in rebuilding. Uh, I think building Syria start from now, from this conference, for example, uh, by making the people know and contribute in building uh, families and uh, students uh, who exist now, because uh, to build the society, you have to build a generation. And by f this five years, we, we lost almost a whole generation who build the future. Uh, for me, I think as a gynecologist, I will focus again on woman, woman, woman again, <laughs> because this is very important and we, we should give this a very important um, concern. And the woman in the next phase is very vital uh, in raising children and taking care of everything, always for women. Thank you. So the next question, please. Okay, this is to everybody. What do you think artists, creatives, and entrepreneurs can do to help the global platform for Syrian students and other students in similar situations by Candice? Since it's uh, specifically referring to the global platform, President Sampaio, perhaps you have some words to say on this? Well, that's part of my daily work. It's uh, like... Uh, President Clinton used to say, work the films, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, something like this, which I highly uh, thank you for this uh, initiative. Obviously, is uh, pointing out the fact that uh, this has only been possible for three or four reasons. Uh, first, the idea that that's uh, something that happens like that. The other is the supporters from the beginning, either international or national. Uh, and the support, of course, the big support of all the uh, partners, international partners and national partners, namely, in our case here in this country, those uh, like, uh, obviously, universities and polytechnics that have been, uh, from the start, very cooperative in this program. Uh, it's a fact that uh, it's good for us all, Portuguese citizens in this room, uh, and we are in a very specific and brilliant institution, uh, to know that uh, we are much more internationalized than uh, uh, you are an example of that, uh, that one thinks uh, normally. Uh, we think the frontiers are there, there's, there they have been for more than 800 years, it's not true. The, obviously, they're there, thank the Lord, but uh, the fact is that this uh, interchange happens uh, all the time, and our universities are now, uh, fortunately, in polytechnics full of foreign students, and this helps uh, contacts. Uh, we have all the scientists that come, and like yourself and others here in this room and others in this institution, everywhere in, in uh, all sorts of scientific institutions around the country. This is the future, and uh, the future obviously has to count on uh, a great internationalization, uh, a great uh, interchange, and contributions to what is signal there is essential because, after all, it is a pleasure, uh, but it is a, uh, a rather heavy pleasure to, to have the possibilities to pay these scholarships every month. 
because we see by this session and all the others who are scattered from Bragança to Évora uh, to, and to Faro, uh, Coimbra, Aveiro, uh, Porto, Braga, Guimarães, etc., uh, that people are integrated, universities are uh, used to this. Uh, they have, uh, as we heard here today, very eloquent uh, speeches that uh, all this helps the formation. And I have to uh, tell you something. It was a great honor to, to be here. Uh, I think I can reveal what is public, but not public as that. Uh, Madame uh, Leonor Blaise is part of the global platform. Uh, she's a member of the board. Uh, she's very silent on that all the time, but she has been a, a strong supporter of this from the beginning. And I'm happy that uh, uh, what is uh, the foundation which uh, she presides, and of course the scientists brought this program forward uh, and have this, uh, uh, I didn't quite get the name ARA or what, what it is, yes. Uh, um, continue to uh, integrate scientists uh, in the outer world, so to say, and bring in what needs to be, be brought in. And this, I think, is uh, something that you, in our website and through direct uh, 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 initiatives and dinners or whatever, we had a dinner last night. We're going to have a, um, how you say, lay loan. An auction, Jesus Christ, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> Uh, an auction with uh, painters, uh, voluntary given paintings to, to uh, one from Paolo Rego, which especially offered, she's one of our greatest painters, if not the greatest at the moment. Uh, she, so we, we will have an auction, we will have a concert, we will have this, we will have that. We have to keep this going. Because one thing which I think is, uh, is, is a, a great uh, success for ourselves, and I'm not looking at this time of my life for success anymore. Uh, and I have no campaign to deal with, uh, 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 fortunately, uh, is that uh, looking at you three here and others that I have met throughout the country, uh, something good is happening. And something important is happening. For those young boys and girls or young uh, students, um, they know this country, they know our hospitality. Others, which are in three or four other countries we persona in the map, are contributing. And this is really what uh, one can do in front of uh, a very dramatic and uh, unthinkable conflict uh, with all the consequences that, is, that are taking place. And so uh, I, I will have something to say in, at the end, but uh, I was uh, really very honored because you displaced yourselves from v various parts of the world. You keep on traveling all the time to be here tonight and in a, in a way to uh, help this being pushed forward. But let me tell you, this would not go forward without the uh, extreme help and uh, engagement from the part of our higher education institutions in this country uh, and others. And if the offer of uh, places has been very big in many places in the world and we can't match that for lack of obvious, obvious, obvious lack of funds, it shows that there is something on which we can build a more uh, uh, a platform for having a um, something dealing really worldwide with uh, the higher education in emergencies, which is very sad but understandable to a certain degree that internationally one is more concerned with, uh, of course, the first uh, education, the second education, primary education, secondary education, and only 1%, you were saying 2%, uh, are concerned with, the, with, uh, with the higher education. As a whole. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's amazing to think that how on earth, as you were saying, how on earth is a country to be reconstructed? I mean, we've lost five years of a, a generation who could be graduate students, which are obviously everywhere in the world, either on the run or 
looking for some places or in places where they can't study because they are not allowed to study. I don't go into details because that's a very difficult story. But it's, it's the last chance. And it's a last chance in the sense that uh, you have to have the possibility of not leaving, aside from their own human possibilities, rights uh, and wishes to have their own personality uh, being formed, the right to be uh, educated, because that is a right, and to help society go back to their countries and rebuild them. Uh, whatever happens in the future, and I hope something will happen. But I'm sure of one thing, that we are contributing in a, in a very small way, but as a, what I would call a pilot project, with other projects going on in various places, that if we unite on this, uh, if we find a, uh, a platform, uh, a global platform, in fact, dedicated to higher education in emergencies, putting all the pieces together, because there are, it's like a mechano, you can, you have the institutions there. They are used to have foreign students. They have departments for foreign students. There is a, there is a continuum in, in the education system which uh, allows, in fact, uh, one sector to go to the other and so on and so on. And this is, from all these initiatives that we learn of, if we put them together, if we find uh, really a, a pillar of uh, a higher education community, which is already there. It's, it, it's really how to coordinate all this and to have something dealing with how to uh, put in, in march this kind of opportunities and finding the appropriate instruments. And then, of course, a financial facility, but that's uh, a different thing that has to be taken care of. And I think that we have, we are doing our best to contribute to the uh, building up of societies, rebuilding societies, nations uh, and countries uh, rebuilding, as we so eloquently heard tonight. And this, uh, I think, is something that uh, if everyone contributed with one pound, one euro, or one dollar, you know, uh, with all the students and scientists that we have, this would be uh, a movement greater and greater. So I Instead of reading these uh, things I have here, I will go through them very quickly in the end. But nevertheless, uh, I'm really so happy to see that uh, top scientists who are in this uh, foundation had the idea to come across and use one of your sessions to bring forward what is happening uh, to some of these uh, uh, citizens of the world who are now benefiting from the right they have uh, and the, giving them tools to fight for an aftermath of peace and uh, building of their own countries. And I really am uh, of the opinion that they, they are really interested to do that in the future. This is what I hear every time I speak with them, and I think eloquently we heard this tonight. I, I always speak too much. But, uh, <laughs> uh, Thank you very uh, much, President Sampaio. It's been a privilege to work with your platform. Um, I, we have another question. Uh, this is to Dr. Barakat. Do you think that the international emergency assistance has given due priority to supporting education at all levels for refugees and IDPs in countries hosting people fleeing from other areas of conflict? Isn't that one of the major factors why people seek refuge in Europe? <laughs> yes. A wordy question. <laughs> well, um, education as a whole, was only included as, a, as, a, as one of the pillars of humanitarian assistance recently. Uh, usually or traditionally we focused on water sanitation, health, uh, and shelter. Uh, so education, we've come a long way in, in terms of it being considered an important pillar of the assistance. The amount of uh, resources dedicated to it, uh, uh, I still think is not uh, sufficient. But more importantly, we need to invest in, 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 uh, on the how in which we deliver education rather than where we deliver education and what kind of education we deliver in refugee camps. And uh, if we were to do a, an objective study across those camps, 
very quickly you come to the conclusion that higher education has got to be integrated. And for it to be integrated, students have come, ha has to come out of the camps, so you can't, because you cannot bring universities into camps. Uh, otherwise, you lose that whole benefit that uh, uh, our colleagues here so eloquently illustrated of having the mobility to move around and to meet the other. There is no point of educating people in what is fundamentally a, a, a prison. I mean, it's, many of those camps, if you go and see the one uh, Zatari, with all due respect to everyone who's looking after it, because of the political circumstances, it is a prison, but it's uh, huge. Now, uh, uh, within that environment, you can't deliver quality education. You cannot have interaction with society. You know, there are lots of issues that you cannot do. Now, for, for this to happen in, in a serious way, I think uh, we need to do many, many changes. To start with, I think the basic concept of, of refugee has to be revisited. The uh, refugee law that we have today is based on needs that emerged in Europe 60 years ago for a specific context, a specific number of uh, refugees that they needed to relocate and so on. Uh, that doesn't apply anymore. And this is one of the reasons why the countries that receive most refugees do not sign up to the convention. Uh, Kenya, Jordan, Pakistan, because what it demands of the state is far too much. It's impossible for them to cope given the numbers they have to deal with. So they end up avoiding the law or working around the law by creating protocols and uh, side agreements and so on. All of that reduces the quality of the assistance that you, you should really give as, as a host country. In addition, I think, uh, and this is something that I witnessed during the Iraq crisis in Jordan, the international community was reluctant to support the education system within Jordan. Now, Jordan, during the Iraq crisis, if you recall, they did not put anyone in a camp. They allowed them all to integrate within society. They received them as, as guests. And there was a time there were almost three quarters of a million Iraqis in, in Amman. Uh, and they allowed them into the schools. But it took many, many years for the international community to understand that Jordan on its own cannot cope. They have to come to their help. They have to help them expand the sizes of the classrooms, the teaching uh, staff, et cetera. And uh, there are many opportunities offered from within the refugees that are not exploited. You know, we know that a lot of refugees come. There are teachers amongst them. There are people who have done two years university, three years university that can be requalified as a teacher relatively easily. But we don't invest necessarily in those areas. The people see it as too complicated. Mm -hmm. So we have an issue with the law. We have an issue with the hosting state. We have an issue with the international communities responding. And I think when it comes to the Middle East, where this has been protracted for now good 15, 20 years since the Iraq war, uh, we must, this is why I keep going back to the region, the region has to take control of itself. We must sit together and work out a system in which we even come with our own regional protocol, even if it conflicts with the, with the universal one about what is it we want to do within the region. We can't continue to tackle fire fighting in corners allowing the problems to be uh, addressed by someone else, particularly now that the financial expectation of the world is that the region should contribute uh, a considerable amount of it, and they are doing. The Gulf countries are putting a lot of money, but they're not necessarily following it up with the uh, technical investment and, and the planning uh, and the leadership that they should do. William, I think you had something to say. Uh, I, would like, I would like to thank Professor, uh, for his talk, but I also have different opinion when it comes to keep people inside their countries in the Middle East. In my opinion, if you want really to help the student nowadays, you should to remove them from that area. Let's really <coughs> face the truth. That area now is just for war, and I have experienced that. I'm not just talking because of the media. I was there. I lived there four years in the war. When we came to Europe, here we could see the difference. We could really see how these people treat with their differences. A major part of people that still live now in the Middle East think that they are the best. Uh, other people are nothing. And we don't need to have anything more. But since I came here, I can see why these countries, why these communities are more developed. Because th there's here freedom. While back in all Middle East, there's no freedom. There is nothing freedom, for example, for the woman. I cannot, I, I need to say, like, uh, I need to um, 
like be really diplomatic when it comes to religion in all these places, but here not. Here I can say that I don't believe in anything, or I can say I believe in this thing. Nobody, no one will judge me because of this. So again, in my opinion, it's, n it's not good at all to keep a student in Middle East. If you really want to build a person, you need to put that person in a civilized community. Communities like in Europe, in America, but not in what they call, I, I don't call them community back in the uh, Middle East from the first place. Can That's I, my opinion. Can I add a point? Very short point. Um, I'm, I'm hearing Middle East, Europe. The problem that we are creating uh, borders. Let's uh, uh, think of an idea of crossing borders between the both sides. If we are thinking keeping the student or bringing the student, this is not the solution. We have to, to, to rebuild from here and from that area. We cannot say like, no, this is bad community there because we are one of those communities and I think we, we are able to, to do something. So not all the communities are not doing efforts. There are some efforts, but it's needed time to change and to be in a level that you can share your freedom or whatever you could be. So crossing the borders is the solution. It's not to keeping or rebuilding. It's crossing. Thank you. I think this is probably a discussion that could last us the rest of the evening, but yeah. I think we <laughs> have to move on. Um, I don't know how many more questions we have up there. Are there any more? No? Uh, looks like you come not. In? Why don't you come? <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> okay, we have too so many. Um, so this we this one can be for Dr. Beale since we haven't heard from her yet. Uh, what is the percentage of academics who are educated abroad that actually return to their home countries following conflict? I'm not sure if I'm not sure. I I can't give you a, a percentage globally, um, but but what I can say is that. Um, very often, uh, people talk about brain drain. So my experience in Africa is uh, very often students who, uh, or scholars who've left the continent and gone to the States, to uh, European countries, are seen as part of a, a brain drain. That is, I think, a very old-fashioned way of looking at it. Um, and we talk about brain circulation now. So that's the first point I'd make. The second, my experience in, in South Africa is that people have gone back. Um, Thabo Mbeki, the first president after Nelson Mandela, educated at University of Sussex, went back. Um, and f for better or worse, whatever you think of his presidency, <laughs> he contributed to his country. I think, um, you know, I can think of very many people um, who were educated abroad and who've gone back. A recent study um, done, uh, a longitudinal study looking at uh, people in Ghana who have been in political leadership, many of them educated abroad, uh, many of them in groups like yourselves. And what the study showed was that it was actually being abroad together as a cohort thinking about the future of their country, going back, not necessarily at exactly the same time, but round about the same time, and contributing to a country's development that actually has escaped uh, conflict. It's been through ups and downs, Ghana, it's, um, but it's, it's escaped real conflict. And I think that's a really interesting way of seeing uh, the, 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 the issue. It's not about, I don't think you can control people. You can't say you have to go back, but people ultimately do. And increasingly we're living in, a, a, as you said, a borderless world. The more we can um, cross borders uh, and go backwards and forwards, the better. Thank you. I'm being told that we're getting very close to our time budget, so one last question. Um, to all, how can you change the stereotyped image of a country from one of war to a more positive one? Um, perhaps we could start with one of the students to, to try and answer that. Change the image of a country. Do, so yeah, if combat. the country, I suppose, Syria right now, in most people's minds, have, has an image of war. It has an image of conflict. 
And I'm sure that none of you want that to be the image of our country. So do you have any ideas? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, when we have this chance to come here, for example, or for any other Syrian student, I think every individual, every Syrian student has the responsi responsibility to represent his country and give the positive image. This is at least the individual contribution. Um, maybe I could say also if the media could focus on the positive part also, not just the negative, you know, the negative part of what's going on, for example, in my country in Syria. Yeah, there are a lot of bad stuff uh, going, but if you need to break the stereotype, maybe the best, uh, the best case is to show example of good people. Like we have also now good successful Syrian people among almost all the world doing something good. And uh, some of them, uh, I, I can't remember the name very good, but maybe got um, a Nobel Prize like uh, two or three years. Yeah. Uh, so maybe if the media can also focus on the positive part, not just the negative part. That's my opinion. Uh, I think we are, we had a question about entrepreneurs and ar artists. Uh, making, uh, uh, for sure, media is focusing on the negative part. It's one, one of their work, one part of their work. But also focusing on the positive for, uh, part by making a diversity club, uh, conferences, um, uh, theater uh, sketches, anything will make the people attract to this issue, will make them uh, break this stereotype, show, for example, that there is so many successful uh, Syrians exist where, like, uh, you have a, a big musician, Malik Jandali, you have Dina Kutabi, you have so many who raised in Syria, finished their study, and they are outside showing their work to the, to the world, but, uh, Men uh, names just n not mentioned in the media. Thank you. Um, is there any more academic perspective on how, how a country can grow and change its image after, after it has a stereotype of, of war? Well, obviously, the starting point is to stop the war. <laughs> and uh, in the context of Syria and for the Syrians, the starting point is to realize that they're fighting somebody else's war. And it's gone a long time ago, the initial demands that the people wanted on the, when, they, when they took to the streets. The conflict today has, is much bigger than what they were demanding uh, initially, and it involves many more actors from outside. So really, the start is to sever those relationships if they can, and focus uh, on what is beautiful about Syria. I know Syria reasonably well, and to my mind, it will never have a war stereotype because I have lived it. I know what the Syrian people are capable of. I know how beautiful it is. And I can assure you very quickly when they stop, uh, the stereotype will reverse. It's a bit like Lebanon. Lebanon took very few years for us to forget all about the Lebanon war. And, and Syria will, will follow that track. There are certain exceptions to do with the actions of ISIS and, and um, you know, on this sort of eastern part of, of the country that would require maybe a little bit more time to get out of people's uh, memory. But uh, as a whole, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think, uh, I, I hope that the ceasefire will continue, will continue to be renewed, and uh, I hope that there will be a, a resolution uh, soon. And it has to be a compromise on all sides. I think um, I was saying this earlier. My position is that uh, there is no way but to accept Assad as being part of the solution for now, while eliminating a lot of people around him, eliminating them, not physically you know, killing them, but taking them out of, <laughs> out of uh, his structure. Um, the, uh, the way the international community is so focused on one man, it may work in the United States, because this is how they like the politics. You have to have Saddam Hussein, Assad, someone, but it doesn't really within the regional context. And uh, if anything, it helps those shadowy figures around him to survive. And I suspect if they get pushed, they may sacrifice him themselves and they survive. Uh, and that would be the nightmare, that you enter a political settlement with those characters uh, would be very, very difficult to sustain. Dr. Beal, do you have anything to add? I, I, th I think there are things that one can do in a, a post-conflict 
space that can, can help. Um, I think, you know, the media is an issue. I would agree with that. Um, I think there are some countries where, and here I'm thinking of countries in Africa, where reconstruction has been really, really difficult. Mm. You know, uh, we talked about Democratic Republic of Congo, reconstruction there in that huge, vast geographical territory um, with limited infrastructure is going to take much longer um, than in a, a smaller context, a more internationally connected context. So uh, from the British Council perspective, I would say um, international connectivity, engagement, and not closing down the borders, the barriers, the communication would be important. I think there are physical things one can do. I, I, I think of the Mandela Bridge in Johannesburg, which linked you know, one part of the city that was predominantly white to one that is predominantly black. Very symbolic, but those things that in must are similar, and this is more your territory than mine, but um, w where you can make those symbolic infrastructural changes. But I think it's keeping those bridges, me metaphorical and real bridges open. Thank important. you. And uh, President Sampaio, I wonder if you, you think that the global platform will have a role in, in changing the stereotype of, of the country. I think that we need um, the idea to be enlarged and, uh, and uh, we have two international meetings now. Uh, one is the uh, meeting in uh, Istanbul, the humanitarian forum, and the other one is a special session in New York in September of migrants and refugees, etc. And if we can put forward uh, the topic of uh, the higher education in emergencies as something which is uh, something to be dealt with seriously, because it's a waste of uh, a generation <coughs> if this is not scoped with uh, uh, properly, the elements are there. And I think that we've, if we uh, put our act together uh, with the countries involved, with uh, those who really are prepared uh, to be part of this uh, uh, necessary build-up uh, because it's a, a necessary build-up in terms of the rehabilitating or reconstruction of serious uh, uh, wartime consequences. Uh, and of course we need uh, generations of prepared people to, to build this in the future. Uh, I agree with what you said in the sense that this has become much uh, uh, more uh, uh, complex than it was at the beginning of the, of the crisis, but uh, uh, our friend here, Joe, has, has spoken about cases in Africa, etc. Um, I think that we, we can't miss this opportunity that it has been given to us that really focusing on higher education in emergencies is something that is an element, essential element of education in general, and now, as you pointed out in your first intervention, the fact that you have the possibility of uh, uh, connecting development and humanitarian aid, this is a new approach, which is clearly the new approach which is now coming out of the documents that were recently approved at the United Nations. This shows the way to the future. But now for this, we need something that is already there, is to put together scientific institutions, universities, etc. Uh, the students are there waiting for help. Uh, we need financial facilities to, to put this thing uh, going and a platform to coordinate this, whatever. I don't go into details. But one thing is clear. If we cannot allow ourselves to finish this uh, 2016 two great uh, meetings without really putting on the table a, a paragraph, a paragraph, and after that a group of friends which will take things forward. This is what I think are the next steps. Everyone is mobilized for this, I would say. And uh, without going to repeat these words, I have to thank, of course, uh, Madame Leonor Bleza and the group of uh, scientists, uh, Ara, who has <coughs> it's so complex to understand what is behind Ara. It's neuroscience. It's something that I, I really don't know anything about. <laughs> uh, I, hope I, I hope I won't have to benefit from your knowledge in the future, which uh, <laughs> gives me some health some healthy prospects. And of course, uh, um, to all the uh, Syrian students here present today, which was uh, a great occasion. Uh, I know you went through some efforts to be uh, 
to speaking to audiences like this. And, and I want to thank uh, those who, uh, it was the first time I saw it myself, uh, to Maria and Duarte for their video producers, which I think was a great success. Uh, you saw some of our students here uh, scattered throughout the country, and it was beautiful in terms of the message it brings. So uh, my uh, last words is, of course, to thank our speakers who uh, took the way through airplanes and airports and, and a lot to be here today and to be somewhere else tomorrow. Um, they have never been to Lisbon before, which is obviously something that uh, they have to be punished. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 agreeably, of course, uh, we'll find a way to do that. And thank you all of you to be here today. There is clearly a message coming from yourselves, uh, your attention, your, uh, your militancy. Uh, this is a great uh, challenge for all of us and it's obviously a great help and it keeps us moving. Uh, and I'm sure that you will be moving. I'm sure that you will be uh, in contact with us and this can be enlarged to uh, lots of places and lots of people. This is what we pretend. I also am very thankful to, uh, she didn't reveal that secret, uh, but uh, she, by, by simply an offer, one of my best friends, university mate, in the same course, in the same university, she's living in his home. Uh, he's somewhere there, I'm not going to point him out, mm -hmm. but it's very rewarding. Uh, we have the same age, but here he is, voluntary having you at his place, yeah. uh, and his uh, sister having you, another, another yes. student from Syria. This is the kind of thing that helps uh, a lot and gives uh, uh, militancy and responsibility to yourselves, as you so well illustrated here today. So thank you all very much, and thanks our foreign guests here today, and thank you, uh, uh, Madame Berleza, uh, chairing of this uh, magnificent uh, foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Sanfayo. And as I said before, it's really been a privilege to us uh, to work with the Global Platform and to see the work they're doing, to meet the amazing students who have become really close friends of ours now. Um, I'd just also like to say thanks to Elena Bechoku, who is the, the secretary of the, of the platform and has supported us throughout this whole uh, event. To the Champalama Foundation, and especially Dr. Lynn Obeleza, who is so supportive to all the R events that we do. Um, and always gives her time and, and will always support us in everything that we try. To Associação Viva Ciencia, who helped publicize this event. Um, and lastly, to all the volunteers from R, to all my team, uh, not my team, but the team of which I'm part of, it's always a pleasure to work with you. And of course, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'd just like to say that there will now be a, a drinks reception outside. To those of you with a VIP ticket, there will be a reception in the other building. Um, so there will be someone to show you there. Um, and everybody else, there'll be also some drinks here as usual within our event. And just one last tiny plug. Um, in case you have nothing to do on the 21st of April, we have our next art event. Um, it's uh, to do with any, can the gut uh, influence the brain? So we're back to neuroscience again um, and exploring interactions between different parts of your body. So thank you again, everybody, for being here.